Many biblical scholars talk about the way in which Mesopotamia and other ancient Near East cultures influenced the Bible. Yet, what about the ways in which these stories drastically differed from those of their neighbors? And yet, some of those customs continued despite God's disapproval. Greetings and welcome to the Bible Paladin, Reading Between the Lines. In this series, instead of looking at particular chapters of the Bible, we will be addressing some of the various themes and questions that come up as we read the Bible. And in today's episode, we'll be exploring three ways in which the God of Abraham seems to disregard certain cultural values or customs, and what it meant for the people of Israel, and what it means for us today. There are some obvious theological assertions that do set the Bible apart from the mythic stories of their neighbors, the biggest being that of monotheism. The concept of having only one God was revolutionary during this time period, and much of the textual evidence suggests that even the earliest pre-Israelites still believed in other gods. They just believed that theirs was the greatest. This is why the first commandment had to be given, for it took a long time for them to be freed from the widespread belief that held the existence of many gods. But the theological assertions are not what we'll be looking at today. Rather, those that have to do more with tradition and culture. We'll be looking at the right of the firstborn, the status of women, and the practice of polygamy. The right of the firstborn was not only prevalent in ancient societies, but also was continued up until today. Royal lines, heirs, and even responsibilities are often given to the firstborn male son through various cultures and parts of the world. In fact, oftentimes it just makes things easier. I have two brothers, and my older brother has been appointed as the executor of our parents' will. We are all responsible adults, but he's the firstborn. It's not a big deal, but shows how ingrained such a custom is. And it is obvious that it was not only part of the culture of the ancient Israelites, but also was codified in their laws. But was God really in favor of such a view and practice? It would seem that he was not. If you've been following this series on Genesis in this channel, you would see how often that God seems to go right past the firstborn and choose the second. Not bad news for us secondborns. And this seems to start with the first children when God accepts Abel's sacrifice over Cain's. But let's look at the patriarchs. Abraham's firstborn son was Ishmael, not Isaac. Isaac's firstborn was Esau, not Jacob. Jacob's firstborn was Reuben, but his birthright was taken away because he slept with his stepmother. The next two, Simeon and Levi, were a bit too prone to anger and violence. So it was Judah that the bulk of the promise went to, and from his line that the Messiah would be born. It is even from his name that we get the term Jew. It wasn't that he was any better than his older brothers but he did repent and acknowledge his sins. If the birthright was so important, why would God not choose the first from Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob? There seems to be a pattern here. After Genesis, we still continue to see this pattern for whom God calls. Moses was the younger brother of Aaron. King David had seven older brothers, and King Solomon wasn't the firstborn either. And I'm sure there are many other examples. And yet, in human nature seems to want to always choose the firstborn son. And there may be some reasons for this. The firstborn was seen as the strength of the family, the assurance of heirs, and even had authority over the other children. In fact, there are multiple passages in the Bible that continue this custom, even in the law of Moses. But most of these seem to come more from his people and their stubbornness than from the Lord himself. Perhaps God wants us to take another look at this, to read between the lines, even those of the law. If we look at the creation story, the firstborn of God rebelled. It was therefore their descendants that God would work with. I don't mean to be blasphemous about this, but God's first crack at humanity didn't do really well, and he wiped them out with a flood, and pretty much started over with the younger children, as it were. To take this further, God doesn't seem to trust the firstborn, and it shows, particularly throughout Genesis. This view will be further explored in the New Testament, using the Jews and the Greeks allegorically as the first and second born. There's also another way to see this particular phenomenon. God is shown often to take care of those who are considered more vulnerable, those who are weaker than others. And since culturally the firstborn was seen to be the strong brother, it was the others that were seen to be less than. And so God brings them up. He allows them to use their strengths, which are not always seen, especially in the culture in which they lived. For example, with Jacob and Esau, Esau was the stronger brother, but God allows Jacob to use his wit and intelligence to overpower him, so to speak. And so God gives them the opportunity to use skills that would often be overlooked in that particular society. 
This next topic may be a bit more controversial, especially when seen from a modern perspective, because the way in which women have been treated in the Bible has been notoriously criticized. But more accurately, it would be to say that the treatment of women throughout history has been bad, and it is also recorded in the Bible. The thing is, when it's in the Bible, people tend to take it as prescriptive, meaning that you should follow the example, rather than descriptive of the times. I even fall into this trap with my language. For example, when I speak about the stories of the patriarchs, instead of saying the ancestors. However, I put forth that God, and therefore his people, were much more sympathetic towards women than their neighbors. Beginning again with the creation story, we see that men and women were created as equals, and only because of sin was the man given authority over the woman, as it says in Genesis 3.16, Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. In the first creation story, we are told that man and woman were created together, with no indication that one had authority over the other. In the second, there is an interesting use of the word helper to describe the woman. As Scott Lenke says, the word translated as helper is the Hebrew word ezer. Interestingly enough, this word is actually used many times to describe God's role with us. See Exodus, Deuteronomy, and a number of the Psalms. And of course, God is our ezer, our helper. This would suggest that both man and woman have a unique and complementary role as being created in the image and likeness of God. We also see that throughout Genesis, God hears the cry of women and shows compassion on them, giving protection to Hagar, listening to Sarah's plight, responding to and allowing Rebekah to act as a prophet, and hearing the pleas of Jacob's wives. Dinah is avenged, and Tamar is shown justice over Judah. These stories certainly don't overshadow the number of times in which women are mistreated, or in which double standards are applied, and yet they do show that God was on their side, and perhaps serve as an example for us. It is the human element that continues to fail, and perhaps the reason why these stories are included in the Bible is to teach us a lesson. While many would assert that the Old Testament approves of and does not condemn polygamy due to the number of men who had more than one wife, it is really not that clear. And in fact, there is more evidence that shows that God did not approve of it. Even though some of the laws refer to polygamy, again, they are not prescriptive. Interestingly enough, one has to do with the right of the firstborn. Deuteronomy 21 states that one should not treat the son of a loved wife as the firstborn if the unloved wife gives birth to a son first. Perhaps a commentary on some of the activity of the patriarchs? Then Leviticus 18.18 18 forbids the marrying of sisters. Again, perhaps influenced by the strife between Jacob's wives. While there is no law outright forbidding polygamy, if we are reading between the lines, we typically only see negative outcomes in the relationships of multiple wives throughout Genesis. The first mention is that of Lamech, one of Adam's descendants, right after we were told that man and woman were created to be one flesh. Lamech was the first polygamist and a murderer. The situation with Abraham and Hagar was a mess. Jacob was tricked into marrying sisters and that didn't go well. David's relationships were a disaster and Solomon's many wives influenced his choice to go after false gods. So while polygamy was practiced by many figures in the Old Testament, this doesn't indicate that it was condoned by the Lord. There are many bad activities that we see recounted, even by those whom God chooses to accomplish his plan. This does not indicate that they were worthy of imitation. And marital laws and customs were much more of a cultural practice and not seen in the religious sense as they are today. When questions about marriage and divorce are brought up in the New Testament, there is much more clarity regarding this, no doubt influenced by changing culture and a deeper understanding of God's will. Regarding divorce, for example, Jesus responds that it was allowed by Moses because of the stubbornness or the hardness of hearts of the people. And he adds that it was not meant to be so from the beginning. And this may be a good way in understanding many of the cultural norms and even laws that were greatly influenced by the people and customs of the time. While laws were made to give them boundaries, what was truly the plan of God? So where does this leave us today? First, I'll say that I believe that God is still countercultural. And just because something is a law or a custom or practiced by the culture, it doesn't make it right or just. And especially when churches or governments seem to get behind a particular law or remain quiet about it, it makes it even more difficult to discern. And I'm not just talking about those things that are explicitly stated in the Bible. We are living in a culture that is dealing with things that never came up back then or certainly weren't thought about in the same way that they are today. 
gender issues, artificial intelligence, genetic manipulation, modern warfare, and bioethics, just to name a few. What can we take from these ancient stories that we can apply to today's questions of faith and morality? That question becomes deeper if you believe that God's word is deeper than what is seen at first glance. When we look at the examples above, what are some common themes in God's reaction to these cultural norms? Compassion, hearing the cry of those who are vulnerable and overlooked, justice, and ultimately, relationships. The three examples that we looked at are essentially human traditions that arbitrarily put one person over another, whether it be the firstborn, man over woman, or pitting wives against each other. These are things that create division and injustice. If we are made in the image and likeness of God, then should we not accept to see our brothers and sisters through an equally compassionate and just lens? There is no doubt that division continues to exist, and sometimes the chasm between sides seems to be impossible to cross. Not everyone even wants to try and have a conversation. Perhaps that's where faith comes in. That and the resolve to continue to learn and grow first in our relationship with the Lord, and then seek to understand our brothers and sisters. If you have any questions or suggestions of topics that you would like to include in this series, please let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe so that you won't miss an episode. Thanks again for joining me and continuing with me to the end. Until our next conversation, God bless and keep reading between the lines.